So tonight we're looking at the topic of um, missional innovations and also more specifically, how can we be more missional um, in our local church, in our local context, especially during this season of COVID-19 and pandemic. Um, and I think tonight's panelists made up of all Ridley graduates and Ridley students have brought with them much expertise in their field. Um, they have a lot of insights, a lot of um, experience in this area, a lot of passion as well in this area. So it'll be really interesting to hear from this highly, highly valuable um, and competent panelist. So once again, um, I'd like to encourage you, if you have questions for the panelists along the way, do pop your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I will take questions from you for the panelists towards the end of the session. Um, so first up, I'd like to introduce a very good friend of mine. Um, some might call, uh, well, I call him my brother from a different mother. Um, and that is Stephen. So Stephen, come on up. Hey. Hello, Stephen. How's it going, Wayne? And Good. hello to everyone listening in or watching. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Stephen Tan uh, is a Ridley graduate. And he, you graduated, was it last year or two years ago? Um, actually, 2017. So uh, it's been a while now. Oh, 2017. So last, yeah, that was my last year. Oh, yeah. my goodness. That's a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, time flies. <laughs> Um, and um, some of you might have seen him. He's um, featured in one of our portrait videos. Um, he's been labeled the controversial student. You can find his video on our Facebook page. He very gladly um, obliged us to film and interview him. He's also um, known for his very good fashion sense on campus. Um, and you know that's one thing that he never mucks up as well. Um, but enough of the peripherals. Stephen, can you just... Uh, in five minutes, tell us um, who you are, what you do, and what's your perspective as a pastor during this COVID season? Sure, sure. Um, so, uh, uh, what, what, so I'm a pastor of the lead pastor of Regeneration Church Monash, which is a, a church plant uh, right across the road from Monash University, the main campus, which is in Clayton. Um, um, we planted with the, the Baptist Union, so we're, we're Baptist, even if it's not in the name. And uh, we're also part of the City to City Network. That's our church planting network as well. And uh, we actually, I actually started planting uh, whilst, just as I was completing my course. So I was, I was still doing my last subject at Ridley when we, when we first launched in, in 2017. Um, so yeah, we're, in the, we're just about reaching the three-year mark uh, in, in, um, in, in, in Clayton Monash area. And um, yeah, I mean, God has been good to, to us in, in this time. Um, we've been able to, um, I guess, uh, assemble a team of Christians mm -hmm. who are, bring many giftings to the table and, um, and been able to, to reach many people and on, on campus. I mean, uni students, that was one of the reasons why we came out to plant. But also one of our core values is uh, to be a transcultural community one that um, welcomes people from every, every culture, every ethnicity, every nation, mm. um, as, as our mission is to, to make disciples of all nations. And I think that's particularly um, uh, relevant where we are in Clayton, which according to SBS is the most uh, culturally diverse suburb. In oh, is that right? Really. Yeah, apparently there was a okay. report that came out a few years ago that said there's like 120-ish nationalities in, in, in Clayton. Wow, okay. Um, I, I, I must be honest, I have not met even close to 120 <laughs> but I take SBS word, word for it. Yeah. But, um, but I think so, so having that uh, being a very particular um, focus of our, our, our identity as well, a core value of our church. Um, and, and so we, when we assembled the team, we intentionally assembled uh, team members, uh, core team members from different um, nationalities, ethnicities, cultures, um, different, you know, skin tones and accents mm, mm. Um, to, to reflect that diversity. And, and it's, and it's w worked out well. I think we've seen lots of people come from a variety of yeah. nationalities. Yeah. Just in terms of, um, just in terms of, of COVID, 
um, I, I mean, I have found it to be to be a bit of a challenge um, for myself personally. Um, I think I'm a, I'm a bit of a, an extrovert personally, so didn't really realize how how big a toll not being with people in person was gonna take yeah. on me. Um, but um, I think one of one of the the, the positives is our, our church also uses a, a missional community model. Mm-hmm. So we, what that means is that we um, are, every, we are, we are get, we are, we on a Sunday we draw and it's you know typical traditional church where you've got it's centered on on um, prayer pr- praise and and preaching. But then during the week we're also part of um, we're also made up of smaller groups of missional communities and and we have a very high because it's such a central part of our church we have a very high percentage of our members that are in those so maybe like 90 something percent of people are in a missional community so what that meant was that when um, the pandemic hit and when we had to shut down we were able to decentralize pretty easily because okay. everyone was already there yeah. that was really helpful both in terms of the service yeah um, in, and in people gathering in those smaller groups either physically or, or on zoom but yeah. also for pastoral care as well Okay. Knowing that there's a there's a leader, a mission community leader that was gonna yeah yeah. So so of. sorry so so just for those who are new to the um just just even the term or concept of mission community, in one in less in thirty seconds, can you define and explain what is a mission community, um in your church? Yeah yeah. So I think um one way to say it is it's a family of missionary servants who are disciples who make disciples. So you think of the uh, the three persons of the Trinity: God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Because God is Father, that means that um, in relation to Him, we are His children, and so mm-hmm. we want to live out that ideal of family. Mm-hmm. And that's how we do that in, in smaller groups. It's hard to, harder to do that in a large gathering. Yep. Um, so we have have a lot of meals together, we live life together. Um, we also, and so Jesus is Lord, and so that means that in relation to Him, that we are ser- we are servants. We want to serve each other and serve those outside the church. Um, Jesus is also teacher or rabbi, and so that means we're learners or disciples. We want to learn from God's word, and also um, the Holy Spirit empowers us to be uh, His Jesus' witnesses, and so we're on, we're missionaries on on mission and finding ways to do that. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Cool. Um, thanks for that. So I think it's time that we bring out our next panelist. Our next panelist is um, also a powerhouse person and her name is Julianne. Julianne, please turn your video and your mic on and welcome. Hi, Hi, Julianne. Hi, Wayne. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? (laughs) Good. Got a party on at our house at the moment, so it's a bit loud in the background. That's all right. It's bringing life to the party, literally. (laughs) Uh, So, um, Julianne, um, you're quite, um, how should I put this? You're, you you're quite somebody. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I can't. I can't find any other words to put put it that way. Um, you, you, so you've, you are currently the director of missional engagement with City to City. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And prior to that, you've actually been with AFES for over twenty years. Yes. Yep. So Showing my age. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a very long time. But could you? probably just describe for us in a nutshell um, what you've what what your role entails with city to city and how uh, you end up with that position yeah well um, my role at the moment is really to help church planners to really or any churches actually to get going with evangelism and so I've been meeting up with church planners I feel really spoiled actually in terms of just hearing the exciting stories that are going on for people and helping them to uh, work forward on that and work out a bit of a plan. And yeah, so I catch up with quite a few once a month and we just have a chance to talk things out and to work our way forward. And yeah, it's just been so encouraging seeing what God's doing mm. in those churches. Yeah. Right. So, so your job involves coaching pastors with missional engagement. Yep. Great. So um, just in terms of um, being in a season, of, in, you know, in a COVID-19 world, in a pandemic era, what have some of the challenges you've seen um, either with your role or with pastors um, when it comes to missional engagement? 
Uh, I think the the standard sort of ones in terms of people are uh, not that interested. Um, yeah, just they've got quite a lot of barriers towards faith. Uh, culturally, we haven't done well as Christians in terms of our reputation. Mm. Yeah, so I think they're just fairly normal sort of things. And I don't think the pandemic, although I actually um, have been quite surprised how open people have been during this pandemic. And so I think, um, yeah, I was really thrilled actually after about a week of lockdown, a lot of the church pastors were like, okay, how are we going to think outward looking? Mm. And I was just thrilled by how quickly they turned around in terms of thinking outwardly. Mm. And some of them came up with just some great ideas and yeah, just really working hard. I think there are some challenges just in terms of online fatigue Yeah. and um, how do you connect? Well, how do you look after people when you can't really even see them, but yeah. like, so, slowly things are lifting and yeah, there's great opportunities. Yeah. yeah. That's great to hear. Um, I'm going to quickly move now to Jamie. Um, so he's our next panelist. So Jamie Murray, could you turn your microphone and video on? Hey, Jamie. How are we doing? Good. How are you doing, brother? Very good. Thank you. That's good. Um, so, again, for those who don't know, Jamie is a graduate of Ridley College. Just recently graduated, graduated last year? Yes, finally. Um, finally. Yes, I finished. Eight I years. It only took me nine years to flop over the line. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Probably the best nine years of my life, without a doubt. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, in fact, actually, um, when I started at Ridley College, um, working as a digital content producer, Jamie was actually the first student testimonial, testimonial video I've ever done. So, that's how, <laughs> that's how long it's been, brother. So, wow. And that, that video needs updating as well. So, <laughs> Probably does. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. So, um, just in a nutshell, could you just... Tell, um, tell everyone here tonight, what, what, what is it you do um, with yourself? Um, well, uh, who am I? Yeah. I'm a sinner, saved by grace, praise the Lord. Um, Amen. Also the, the husband to one wife, father of five children, all, all teenagers, which four of them have thankfully gone back to school. So praise the Lord for that also. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's been a challenge of COVID. Uh, but beyond that, for a living, what do I do? Uh, I'm the director in a company that deals in the fitness industry. Mm -hmm. Renegade MMA is what we do. I manage that business. Uh, we look to, I guess, love and serve all those who would call Renegade home. We try and foster and build a community there. So that's that's kind of the front door. People come in to meet their, their fitness goals. Yeah. So, so, have... so, sorry. So just to clarify for people who don't know, when you say MMA, it's mixed martial arts, but yes, the yes, gym yes. that you run, Renegade, is specifically um, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Is that correct? Yes, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, uh, mixed martial arts, uh, seeing two people in the cage fighting each other UFC. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. What we do. Tough love. Um, <laughs> so, but people come in with all different types yeah. of ideas, what they want to do. I always mm. say the fitness industry because that's pretty much what we, we do. Yeah. We get people... If they want to get fit, we get them fit. If they want to become a world champion, we can make them become a world champion. Yep. Uh, but we do utilize martial arts, in particular Brazilian jiu-jitsu, wrestling, grappling, striking. That's what we do. Not your usual run-of-the-mill ministry. Uh, but mm. nonetheless, we look to enter into the world, uh, not being of the world, but in the world, representing Jesus and, and just loving those who come in the door. An extension of what we do at Renegade is uh, another charity that we, we created, myself and a bunch of other people, created Grapplers for Christ Australia. What is Grapplers for Christ Australia? Uh, very simply, it's a community of Christians who love to grapple. We get together, we pray about things, we've done some fundraisers, and we planted about five years ago a charity uh, BJJ Academy in Sunua Bali. So mm, wow. People over there. They're already doing ministry in a, in a local village, a church planted over there. And we just kind of injected some, some funds and some ideas just to try and help grow a facility yep. where we could love and serve the community over there. And, and I guess just um, really extend the kingdom of God into something tangible yep. that people could see. So yep. 
um, that's a snapshot of who I am and what I do. That's that's fantastic. So so the Bali extension is that under the the Renegade umbrella? Well, it's alongside it. We support it. Um, it's kind of its own entity. We pay we play a very very small part in that. Yeah. There's so many different people on the ground here and over in Bali churches and leaders and so many people walking. It's just from five years ago, it has grown into something that's wow. truly amazing. Wow, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have actually been following the photos you've posted about that Bali. Yes. So it's, it's really, really inspiring and encouraging to see what you're doing in that country. Um, Not be- just me. I can't claim the credit. There's sure. Many more- People involved far more intelligent than I yep. that uh, have been that vehicle for. Praise God. Um, so I'm, I'm going to jump quickly back to Julianne. But before that, I, I just want to ask one more question to you, Jamie. So um, you, um, in, in one of our conversations prior to this webinar, you've mentioned to me that um, the, the whole COVID-19 thing has actually impacted you and your business more specifically and, and more directly. Could you just sort of share with us um, how that's been, what's, what's been the challenges and how, how are you actually going with your business and, you know, as, as a community as well? Absolutely. We were shut down uh, on March 23rd. Our facility was closed because indoor sporting facilities are not allowed to operate. Yeah. We're looking at a return June 22nd. Please, everyone keep that in your press. Um, and as I said to people, although our facility shut down, our community is not. We may be hibernating the physical contact, but we're not going to hibernate the way we do community together. So the challenge has been to stay connected. We've done that through, you know, Zoom and text messages and emails, all the things that people do. Uh, And and I really wanted to convey to uh, the members of the people in the Renegade community that, you know, that wh- who am I? What, what holds my identity together? Mm. Uh, yes, I love Renegade and, and I'm a black belt in jiu-jitsu and I've competed all over the world and, you know, I love all these things. But none of those are really my identity. My identity is in my faith in Christ. Uh, it, it's in the family here at home and it's in the friendships um, that we, we have at the community at Renegade. And none of those things have stopped. If anything, they've grown a bit uh, stronger because I've had more time to walk and pray and mm. uh, be with family and, and, and call my friends. So, you know, the community hasn't hibernated. Uh, God's work continues. Kingdom work is on regardless. So, but the challenge has been in staying connected. I, I'll admit that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I felt that we all have to do our part in texting or calling or zooming in or whatever it might be. So it's not without challenges, but I'll agree with uh, Julianne. There's been a lot of opportunities because yeah. people are assessing their life. They're questioning their identity and, and thinking, you know, what, what's the bigger picture? And I don't think anyone could go through the last three months without a bit of reflection <laughs> at some degree and start asking some questions. Yeah. It's challenging, but some aspects rewarding. Who knows where we'll go uh, from here? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. That's that's really really encouraging, and I hope that you're reopening on the June twenty second. Um, yes. At this point. Yeah. Did, is there going to be limits, or is it like free range? Oh uh, yes, there will be limits. Either like ten people okay. on yeah. the class, twenty people in the building. Yeah. If we look to other states, we can kind of get a feel for what it's like. And yeah. I, I think by August we should be back to the new normal or whatever people are calling it. <laughs> yeah. We'll yeah. just take it one day at a time. That's yeah, we can. yeah, sure. So, um, Julianne, yeah. um, we, we're going to have a, a segment now where you're going to introduce to us a tool or, or something you've actually developed um, for many years as a, a, a training tool. Is that, is that the way you would put it? Well, it's how we structured things at uni. And, sure. yeah, it was just helpful in terms of thinking about how yeah. to reach out. Yeah. So, so we want to bring that on because we want to probably, um, before go any deeper, we want to set the framework for everyone. What is it that we're actually, um, I guess, looking at or talking about? So do you want to um, talk us through this, um, this pathway that you've developed? Yeah. Uh, it's really thinking about how much time and effort and energy we want to put into things. And the top is sort of you want to have a lot of connections and a lot of people and a lot of um, ways that you can show love around your community, 
um, uh, for us it was at uni and there's heaps of different ways that we can do this and we should be doing this in terms of thinking about the poor thinking about the isolated and the lonely and uh, different ways that you can do that and really we've seen a lot of that like um, a friend of mine was telling me that her church had provided 200 meals for university international university students just in the last few weeks um, yeah just the getting to know your neighbours, like we set up a Facebook group for all our neighbours and turns out we've got a lovely neighbour who's a Cambodian who I'd never met before up the street and we're now, um, she makes all these spring rolls and now we buy a heap of them. Oh, wow. <laughs> there's, a lot in our, there's a lot in our family and she's an amazing cook to, to raise money for Cambodia. Like there's just so many ways that you can actually love the people around you. Um, the next uh, thing that we, once you actually start loving people, you actually start getting to know people. And um, one of the things that you want to try and work on, and this is what we were working at at uni, is how do you actually help people get to know your Christian friends, you get to know their friends, like actually you just um, be social. Um, one of the things that we used to run was a, a CU ball and one year um, the biomed got a group from their class together and yeah they had Christians and non-Christians and one of the non-Christians invited her boyfriend along and he went to uni and his he had a Christian friend at his uni and I happened to know that Christian friend and he said it was really weird actually because once He'd been to the ball. He had such a great time getting to know people. He actually came back and actually was starting to ask questions, which then is what mm. we often see is once they start meeting a group of people who are Christians, and I think people have a stereotype of what a Christian would look like. And so when they meet a group of Christians, they go, oh, I knew you and I thought you were an, like you weren't just a normal sort of Christian. You're a normal person. But then they meet a few other Christians and realise, oh, actually, this is a really nice group of people. And in fact, um, in our young adults group, one of the young women who's just become a Christian um, basically has invited two other friends along because she goes, this is just such a nice group of people. You've really got to get to know them. And now that I've got to know God, I have actual real peace and just this really great social networking sort of person and in fact that's what's on tonight is all the yeah they're all getting to know each other um yeah so then from that we worked out actually people start actually having questions and yeah we really see this in that we need to be able to give an account and an answer for the faith that we have and um yeah we just find that people actually start wanting some questions answered along the way and then from that once they start getting to some of their sort of questions answered they're a bit more willing to actually think about Jesus and in fact Jesus still got quite a good reputation mm. so yeah. the church might not but um, and I think we're seeing quite a real resurgence in terms of people um, doing alpha courses so online alpha it's actually been fantastic doing online alpha um, I I'm into my eighth week, I think, or ninth week of my alpha. And what I've noticed um, around all the different churches is actually we're getting about 5%. So if your church is, yeah, um, 100 people, yeah, you'd get 5% of that amount of people coming. If you've got 1,000 people, around 5%, I've noticed is sort of the figures, I think, which is pretty exciting. And um when we started out asking at our alpha, like no one said no. And in fact, we've got a someone who um, has quite a bad illness. She actually zooms in from her bed. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just opened up opportunities for people to be able to come. Yep. Um, one church, they did ask all the people from their church to pray for three friends for three minutes a day for three weeks. And yeah, they ended up getting 25 people coming along to online alpha. And yeah, it's just been thrilling to see mm. people actually inviting 
friends along and people being more open to it, I, I feel. Um, and partly that's just because they had less to do. Uh, partly they didn't have to go out. Partly they were able to stay in their own space. And then, um, yeah, it's not too daunting coming. Like it was a little bit daunting joining Zoom, but yeah. Yeah. And then once people get to know Jesus, actually they want to know a bit more about the rest of the Bible is what we found at uni. And we want to be able to provide opportunities. Um, we wanted actually each person to be able to do all of those stages, to be able to love people, to connect them in, to be able to answer their questions themselves. But we also structurally wanted our group to be able to cover all those things as well. So yeah, we wanted to be able to do things as a group to love the uni, uh, the same with social um, and yeah. So, and then out of that, as I, as I start to get to know God and actually love, I think end up growing to love him. They actually want to work out how they can serve him in the community, um, in the church and use the gifts that God's given them. So Hmm. Yeah, we ended up structuring our ministry around that and um, people seem to be finding that helpful. So I've ended up speaking about it quite a bit in the last few months since I started this new job. So anyway. Wow. Cool. So, um, I, well, I've got a question. So um, <laughs> now, obviously, this is a framework, but yes. it's not, um, shall we say, it's not... Uh, it's not the law, right? Like it's not, No. It, 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 there's some flexibility around it. Am I uh, right totally. to say that? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, what you'll find and what we found at uni is the problem was um, most times we just had, you know, a Bible talk that they could come to. There wasn't many pathways in and not like you'd meet someone who's a complete anti atheist and anti-Christian. Hmm. There's no way they're going to want to go straight into finding out about Jesus. They actually needed a bit more space yeah. and a bit more connecting in terms of seeing the real faith and what it looked like on the ground in terms yeah. of people's lives. But then there are other people who are just straight up going, I just want to know about Jesus yeah. Yeah, and get straight into it. Other people might actually turn up at church, yeah. actually not be Christians. Yeah. But, uh, but I think these are sort of um, things that, at some point, people have got to work through. Yeah, right. Or, or, or it might be someone who's living alone, or uh, and and you know, he or she might be I'm in a position where yeah. they're really lonely. They've got no family. Um, I just need community around me to support me yeah. at this moment. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, thanks so much for sharing with us um, your material. Um, I, I believe that. Um, this material is available to people yeah. if they would like to have it. And you have it in a much more fleshed out package. Yeah. Uh, and you're happy for that to go out to everyone attending tonight. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. If they want. <laughs> oh, great. So thank you so much for your generosity. So um, um, Julian has quite a large document, which further fleshes out what she's shared with us. And if you are interested in tapping into that resource, um, feel free to text me, email me or message me here and um, I'll be more than happy to send you the links. Um, at this stage, I want to go to Stephen and then after Stephen, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to Jamie. Um, so Stephen, um, having heard from Julianne, uh, Six Step Pathway, um, I understand that's something that you've used in your church context um, as a yep. training tool, is that correct? That's right, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I think uh, I, I really want to just just um, echo everything that Julianne has said. And and in my mind, when I was thinking about man, what 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 if if everyone leaves this webinar and they just take one thing away, that six step pathway thing would be the best thing for them to take away. And um, so just just from from our perspective, I've only just learned this pathway. So Julianne only just started a job in, in Feb, and she taught taught this to me. And I looked at that pathway, and I looked back at some of the missional community um, kind of mission strategies that we've used. And I realized that actually this pathway kind of describes what we've already done in the past. It's just that we hadn't sort of laid it out in mm. such a kind of clever and, you know, structured way. So for, I'll just give two, two, uh, two examples. So the first one would be um, where we are uh, at, um, at near, near Monash University. There's a lot of 
um, uh, there's a lot of Christian groups on, on campus and they're, they're all quite, quite active, like Christian Union, um, uh, for example. But what, I, what we noticed was that there was nothing that was happening on res, the residential colleges, and all of the, 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 um, the, uh, the ministry stuff was happening kind of during the day normally and on campus itself, whereas the residential colleges are kind of connected to the campus, but, you know, uh, in, a, in a kind of di slightly different uh, area. Yeah. And so we thought, what if we start a um, um, uh, mission community there? And so we did, we started off uh, by, because we had students who joined who did live on res. And initially it was just, you know, uh, that kind of step one and two, love and social running activities, games to kind of build contacts. And then kind so, of- So can you give some examples? Like what, what, what sort of activities would you organize? Yeah, so just with? run like a, like, you know, just run like a barbecue, a games, uh, outdoor games event, because it was still warm enough back then. <laughs> and then yep. from, from there, we sort of build a bunch of contacts. I think the good thing about Julianne's uh, pathway is it's also a funnel that it kind of gets narrower. So it kind of recognizes that not everyone you love and social is going to kind of come to the next thing, like the social step or the Jesus step or the Bible step. And so that's, that was our experience. A lot of students came to the kind of the fun stuff. Yep. And then once we started talking about Jesus, some like, all right, I'm out straight away. But then some remain, right? And so some continue, continue all the way down until to the point where, where some of them got converted and they, they became Christians and they joined the church exactly as, as um, you know, at, at, at the, through those six steps. And I'm saying, and I don't think it needs to be exactly in those six steps, right? So they could, some people could jump from like step two to four, or step two to five or something, right? That might happen as well. And another example, I'll just show you, is what we did at the start of this year. So ever since we started the, um, the church, one of the, uh, the people groups I was hoping to reach was um, Indians and more broadly South Asians because I still I feel very strongly that they are underrepresented in our in our churches in in, in Australia mm -hmm. relative to the, the amount of them like there's tons of East Asians like like me around yeah. but but there's just as many South Asians but they're hard to reach because a lot of them are Hindus it's so so I was thinking if we just run our church the exact same way for like the next ten years it's going to be very rare for any one of them to even darken the door of the church. And so the way for us to reach them is to, to develop a mission community that is specific to reaching them in the same way that, you know, J Jamie's work is specific to reaching a particular subculture, people who are into MMA and, and um, yep. BJJ, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, and so we started that. We, just, we, we started something called Friends of South Asia. And it's only very new. We've only just started because COVID hit, which kind of like, you know, threw a span into the works. But we started off with step one and two the love and social thing, just running a free dinner. And we had like 20 something people come and, and, you know, there were like Hindus and there was even a guy who was a, a, a Pakistani a Muslim wow. come along. And of course we made sure everything was vegetarian and halal. And, you know, these people would have never set foot in a church, right? So they know it's a Christian thing. It's run yeah. by Christians and, and it's, it's held inside the church building, which is our church building. And then, and, and, you know, they would find a rock up. We, we didn't sort of preach the gospel or anything. We just sort of did a social, we, a few, few of us shared testimony yeah. and, uh, and that was it. Just start, start to build community and not, yeah. not try and rush through all the steps. And, you know, it's yeah. not like, yeah. if you don't, if you don't tell the gospel, it doesn't count. No, it does. Because you, you kind of, sometimes you need to actually move slower to be more effective. So, right. Uh, so yeah, really, really, really big on that. Uh, so, um, in, so what, what, what I'm hearing from you is that obviously as a pastor, you're, you know, you're, you've got a, quite a few things in your head in terms of, you know, how do you uh, run a church? How do you grow a church? How do you um, grow the different ministries in the church? Um, but you obviously have a missional focus in mind um, to pastor the church in that sense. So how would you, I guess you can't, you know, you can't do everything by yourself. Like, you know, Jamie was very clear. He wasn't the sole you know, founder of Renegade. He wasn't just the only person running the show. He had a group of people beside him um, yeah. to, to walk beside the champion, whatever that is. Yeah. So in, in your context as a pastor, how have you been, I guess, training yeah. um, people for their missional yeah. work or for their eventual, yeah. evangelistic work? What, what, what yeah. do you do as a pastor? Yeah. No, that's a really good question. Yeah, something I'm really passionate about. I think one of the big challenges for me, like why I even became a church planter to begin with, was because I was evangelist. I, I never wanted to be a pastor in my entire life, even though my dad's a pastor. But it's like it's like I'm a I'm an evangelist first, 
And then I became, then that's what motivated me to become a church planter. And you plant a church and guess what? You, you just become a pastor, right? So that's kind of, <laughs> yeah. but, um, but I think the thing that, that I had to, to learn was that I can't do it all by myself. And there's like 101 things I have to do all the time. And actually for the sake of the kingdom, probably the better thing for me to do is to invest into other people. Yeah. So I think I've heard someone say um, uh, once uh, that the, the era of uh, Billy Graham is over, you know, people actually stop just worrying about trying to find the next Billy Graham because the era of the, the big rally, you know, everyone's going to mm. fill up the MPG. That, that's, that's over. And in fact, some people actually say that alpha is the new Billy Graham. So like Julianne mentioned alpha and core space evangelism is like, you know, is really effective in this era. So, you know, that, that's something that people should really consider. Well, reality, why, why do you think it's effective? Um, why do I think it's effective? I think just because it, it, it seems to be, it, just in terms of the results, I'm not, I'm not going to go into like the pros and sure. cons of it. Yeah. Um, maybe Julian can speak to that later on. But as in just from the results, people are getting saved through alpha um, or, or, or an equivalent. Mm. Um, and, and it's just proving to be effective from the stats. Okay. Um, but, but, I, so the, but the point I was trying to make is that for some people, they're not even ready to go to alpha yet. Some people might say, yep, like, all right, let, let's do it. But others are like, no, nah, I've got no interest whatsoever. And we still need to reach those types of people. So yeah. I think what we need to do is kind of that first two steps in the pathway, the love, love and social steps. And I think to, to do that, we, we need to be training evangelists to not just think about, I need to get people in a room and hear the gospel, but actually how to build a re- genuine relationships with, with non-Christians. Mm. Hmm. Um, so, so, uh, I, I think I remember a, a talk by Tim Keller who once said that this is what he did in, um, in his context in secular uh, Manhattan. And he says that, you know, evangelists, they, they're, they're often are evangelists in our church, even though they're not activated and they're often on the margins of things because they actually, how they're wired, they yearn to hang out with non-Christians and yep. they can get pretty jaded with stuff in church. That's like, man, how many discipleship like programs or things you want me to sign up for? Like, you yeah. know, like, nah, nah, this is not for me. And, and so then, so T- Tim Keller suggested what you can do, especially if you're the leader of the ministry, like the senior pastor or the leader of the ministry, like, you know, Julianne or Jamie's position as well, is actually gather all those people who are evangelists and actually invest into them. Because there's a few, there's a few things about that as well. So first thing is a lot of evangelists don't even know that they are evangelists because yeah. no one talks about them. Like, it, you know, it's not an official thing like playing a guitar or it's not a thing on the roster, right? Yeah. But if you take them aside and say, hey, you know what? You're actually an evangelist. That could be revolutionary for that person to think that the pastor identified that gift in me. Yeah. And, um, and then the second thing is to say, um, gather them together so that they can encourage each other. Mm. To sort of, um, mm. uh, uh, and also to provide coaching because they might have like a hidden talent, right? Like the diamond in the rough or something. Yeah. And you kind of need to sort of, um, develop that talent. So what, what we ended up doing this year, oh, we also spoke to Julianne about it, right? Because that's she's she's our, our our evangelist and mission consultant. And <laughs> and I found out that she had also done the exact same thing when she was um, working at Melbourne Uni, and she had trained evangelists on campus as well. So I asked her what she did, and she said she gave me the advice that um, to try and try and not have too large a group or, or too small. So she reckons a group of four to ten is good. And so that's what we did. We, we started something just last month called Strike Force. Um, that's just my fancy name to sort of get people like excited about what they're doing. Kind Nothing of like, violent. Just... Yeah, like Navy SEALs, you know, like secret agent kind of thing. <laughs> because yeah. it's all behind the scenes, right? No one knows oh, yeah. what you're doing as an evangelist. You, people can't see you up front on the Sunday. You're doing it to start yeah, Monday yeah. to Saturday. Yeah. And, um, and so we got, we got like, we, we, we handpicked like 16 people. And so we divided them into two cohorts. So me and my associate pastor, Paul, we each took about eight, eight of them and just, um, and just sort of started to say, hey, you know, do, doing those things and hearing their stories. And we chose people who were already um, showing either an, a passion, a zeal, or mm-hmm. evidence of evangelistic behavior or activity. Either they already started sharing the gospel to their friends, or some of them are just inviters. They're good at inviting people to church. And that's an evangelistic activity as well. Yep, yep. So, so we gathered those people together and, and we just started that uh, a month uh, last month. And, uh, and, and it's been great. We, um, we, so we just on a nutshell, what we do, we gather them together. We just do three things. First, we spend some time doing a training thing, just a short little training to help them tackle the one, one um, aspect of evangelism. We do a lot of what I call troubleshooting. So people just sharing, where, how's it going with your friend? 
what what barriers do you have and just answering the questions that they, they have and that's really really involved that's the coaching element right and and then and then after that just pray just spend some time praying actually putting in the time to pray for those people mm. and, uh, and 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 it's been really good and we also started a chat on like messenger so like people are sharing like hey i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna meet up with my friend today mm. like i'm gonna read the gospel of john with them today i'm gonna mm. read uncover mark with them like can you pray for me right mm-hmm. or they just be like i'm gonna i'm taking them out for dinner like i'm just gonna try and talk to them about jesus for the first time can you pray for me and that sort of stuff is happening and amazingly just in the la- uh, last couple of weeks since we started strike force one of them led someone to christ i don't think it's it's, it's actually just, you know directly because of strike force they were actually evangelizing them for like like two years before <laughs> before we started this thing but it's just encouraging them to yep. be able to celebrate that with like the team as well and say hey like you know we led someone to christ it's all, that's awesome yeah so um so yeah that's 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 what we're doing and then and, and that's great I, uh, encourage us to think yeah about that's very that's that's really really encouraging to hear uh, I, I do want to move on to jamie um because i'm sure he's got a lot to say as well but i just want to clarify one thing with you Stephen. now when you say that um you, you've got a focus on trying to rally together evangelists um scouting those people that are gifted in evangelism in your community or your church context you're you're not really am i right to say you're not saying that only the evangelists do evangelism it's still every you know like to be a christian absolutely evangelism is part of the package oh, but yeah. what yeah. is different is that um these people are the ones who are specially gifted who probably could lead the church in yeah. evangelism is that is that That's fair right. to say That's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, one of our favorite sayings is um, Charles from Charles Spurgeon. Every Christian is a missionary or yeah. an imposter. Yeah. It's, you know, we, we, we always repeat that. Because we, I think, yeah, yeah, because we want, the, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I think the issue is we just don't have a category for that. We have categories yeah. for like pastors, like Bible teachers in a, like seminary faculty. We have like missionaries, AFES workers, but evangelists, that's, that's not a category we're thinking of anymore. Like I want to mm. be a pr- career evangelist. No one's thinking of that anymore. But I actually think we need to be we need to be seriously thinking about that. We, like, so we've got sixteen guys, right? Who knows? Maybe in those sixteen, there's the next Julianne or the, there's the next Jamie Murray in there. Yeah. That's what I want to see, like the next generation of evangelists. Yeah, amen. Cool. Um, and so that's a good segue, talking about the next Jamie Murray. Um, Jamie, I want to come to you. What's that? One's more than enough. <laughs> oh, I don't know. The world could use with a few more Jamies. Uh, so, um, yeah, so coming to your context, Jamie, obviously you, you will have a very different perspective because let's just, you know, let's just be upfront here. You're, you're, I'm not sure if you would consider yourself as a pastor, probably not so much, uh, definitely, definitely not in the traditional sense. Um, you, you wouldn't, you're definitely not in a church setting you're definitely not in some church ministry setting you're in a very very different um vocational calling uh compared to a lot of other pastors and i suspect that maybe for some of our audience tonight you know they're 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 not they're not pastors you're not preachers they're not um uh uh, workers in the church they're just your um uh they, they work in the secular environment so could you probably flesh that out for us how do you see your work um, as a as a as a BJJ coach, um, as a gym owner? Um, how does that that mission play out in your gym context? Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, look, um, I, I know I know the business that I'm in, and the business I'm in is the business of hope. Like the commodity we use is fitness and jujitsu and MMA and all these things, yet. Uh, I'm in the business of hope. And, and everyone, it's very, very easy for people to see when they come in the door what I'm anchored to. You know, mm. it's Christ. It's, it's, t- it's tattooed on my body. It's written on the wall. It's it's my language. You can't miss it. So mm. much so that, I mean, Christians, uh, are, are, it's very obvious to see the Christians that we're not a church, and I would never claim to be a church, except non-Christians call us a church. Uh, oh, I, really? I, of course they do, because this is where they meet Jesus. Right. So um, I have non-Christian employees. When we have trouble, they know what do we do. We go and pray. The, my non-Christian employees and, and, and staff and, and students, they haven't been taught this. They've just kind of caught this. 
because mm. this is the way we do life. This is our process. We have trouble, we pray. You know. Um, so let me start by commenting on Julianne's document. I think that's wonderful. I, I think it's such a, a well-documented, um, you know, I'd love to get a copy. I want to flesh it out and read it and learn from it. Perhaps if I'd had it 10 years ago, I wouldn't have had to do nine years at Ridley. Who knows? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, um, I, I like Stephen's application of it because we at Renegade, we probably spend our bulk of the time in those first three. I always call it, we're the front line of grace. People are coming in, we're just loving and serving, loving and serving until they ask why, and, and then we tell them it's Jesus. Uh, do we get to those four, five, six parts? Yes, we do, uh, but we're in the long game. We're in the long game there as mm. we're just available, mm. being a presence, uh, almost like a chaplain at the football club or the netball club or whatever it might be. So we're kind of in that long game. And what I like about this document and how Stephen is applying it, it doesn't fall into some of the dangers I've seen where, you know, a church will say, okay, it's evangelism week, bring someone yeah. to church, you know, and everyone's like, oh, am I going to get, you know, it's, it's awkward. Or um, what it doesn't do is uh, a bunch of academics, okay, this week we're running an evangelism course, next week theology course and another course. And the danger in just doing course after course after course is, you can learn about evangelism without ever doing evangelism. Yeah. Uh, and I, I tell people, when you, if you're wanting to do evangelism, don't try and reinvent the wheel or create a program. Look to the natural rhythms of your life. You, you've been created with, with interest. The Lord has put upon you. You might be the motorbikes or race cars or my daughter loves ballet. It doesn't matter what it is that you're into or your kids are into or your, your sibling you're into or wherever you find yourself in life, those interests, you take your love of Christ and let it just be a part of your life. Uh, I think that's an important fact that I'm seeing from the, the document and the way Stephen's applying it. And that's what we do at Renegade. We simply just love the people to come in uh, wherever they are on those steps. And I agree, some people want to hear about Jesus. Other people see the way we do life and ask why, and that leads to Jesus. Uh, some people will never come to church. So I started running uh, Sunday afternoon testimonials. Just got up and started telling stories about Jesus. And I invited other people to come and tell stories about Jesus. We called it Grapples for Christ. And away it went. So there's always ways around mm. it for me. At Renegade, I can make the rules to a, to a certain extent. <laughs> but um, other people working in different uh, genres, like office work or yeah. whatever it might be, I always encourage them, try and be a person of the highest integrity. If you can become that person in the office space or the workplace or the factory that people trust. I've got a problem, I can tell that person and they're not going to spread the gossip. I go to that person because they you know, they listen well and, and I can trust them and they, they seem wise. And that's the way we can, we can say, look, um, I'm going to be praying for you, hmm. you know, and be bold and, and pray for people. You know, I didn't start out week one at Renegade uh, praying for people, you know, but after 10 years, if someone walks on the mat, there's an issue. I don't care about the class. I'll just lay my hand on them and start praying for them in front of everyone. You know, and, 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 and I've never had anyone be uh, offended or unhappy that, that I'm praying for them because I care for them. And I give a hug and then we'll go have a wrestle. So that's a little bit obscure, I know, but that's the way we do it. Prayer and wrestle, that's not a bad combination at all. <laughs> uh, Jamie, I, I've got one um, curious question. I, I'm I think some of the panelists might have questions for you, but I just want, I thought I wanted to ask um, your insights. You, um, so you, you, you've got a very niche, shall we say we've, you, you've got a very niche vocation. It's, it's a very, it's not a very niche subculture, but it is a subculture nonetheless. Yes, um, and yes. with that comes, I suppose, a certain demographic of people that do come along to your gym. You know, if, if I'm thinking like if I was, you know, if I ran like a guitar shop, I probably get a very specific subculture demographic coming to that shop. So in your context, how sensitive are you? Um, and do you even like tailor, I, I suppose the way uh, uh, you, you, you flesh out that, that evangelism or, or that mission in the context that you're in? Yes, we do. I mean, I always give the, the application of a chaplain. 
you know, if you've got a love for football and you're hanging out yeah. doing, doing football all day, that, that would be torture to me personally. But uh, for <laughs> people who love football, then they love that. You know, they're happy to run around the goals and hand back the ball and whatever else they do. Yeah. Um, for me, people come in because we've got something that they value, being they want to get fit, become world champion, get into the UFC or whatever it might be. So we start it on, on that level of relationship mm, mm. but anyone who's ever ever had a personal trainer in life knows that you go through some moments together you yeah. know like they're encouraging you to go beyond the next point and, and you build a trust and relationship and i think it's um and people will look to the person they regard who they can connect with who they trust who they think is the highest moral person in the world so when they have trouble when they have grief when they have things going on in their life that they want to talk to, that's the person they talk to. Uh, and in the uh, martial arts context, you know, the, the sensei or the dojo owner or the coach or all the things it's called, that's the person they look to. Uh, now, I know um, when people look at martial arts or a business or that context, knowing we're not a church, some people often get into that context because they either value money and worship money or they want to be worshipped in that context. Right. So what people come into our environment and realize that I don't care about either of those things. I actually care about that person. I'm there to love and serve them, to listen. If we go out for coffee, I, I try and catch up with my, my, my clients because they're not just clients, they're friends. That's led me to stand alongside um, my, my, my friends in, in the hospital as their parents are passing. Mm. It's led me to be at um, funerals as, as they buried newborns. It's led me to pray at their weddings. Mm -hmm. Just I'm, I'm embedded in their life. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember I met the chaplain for uh, a soccer club in England, Manchester United or something. I don't know soccer, but I remember I met him at a chaplaincy course. And, and he said something to me that I never forgot. He said, when he goes there as a chaplain, it's not just for the, the 20 odd football players. It's for the, the cafeteria lady. It's for the... Yeah the person who's cleaning out the beans, he's here for everyone. Yeah. So for me, being in Kensington, yes, I'm going to love him to all those come in. But when I go down the coffee shop, I don't just turn off the evangelism part of me. I'm there to have a coffee and have a chat, invite people down. And, and that's just an extension of who I am. So we meet people where they're at. Mm. That's what's key. But we also want to make them feel welcome and build the relationship of trust. Sure. I, I think those are the key things to be present, be available, and, and just be a part, a genuine part of people's lives. Sure. That's good. Um, it sounds like that was really good, Jamie. Um, it sounds <laughs> like you could write a whole book on sports theology, and that might be a, you know, that <laughs> might be a great topic we cover in the future. Um, I think Stephen might have something to say about the football stuff, but uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to get started with him because he probably won't stop <laughs> with the football. Um, so, um, just to remind everyone, we are getting to the end of our segment, and I. Uh, if you've got questions, now's the time to start popping questions into the Q and A. Um, I guess I'm just going to leave it up as we let questions come in. I'm going to leave it up to our panelists for some closing remarks. If it's anything you want. Um, the audience and attendees to take away from tonight? What is the one thing they should be um, thinking about in terms of being missional, being innovative in this new season? Uh, Steve, uh, Julian, I'll start with you. Uh, I think just try things. Like, I think that's been the exciting thing for me, seeing like one guy, he was at a gym, he um, started up a mental health group for a heap of guys each night so they all check in make sure they're all going okay during this time um i don't know marriages like there's lots of people struggling with their marriages so quite a few churches have started up a marriage course online like just mm. yeah try things and i think now's the time to just try some things um and be brave and uh, let people have the opportunity. Yeah. Good. Um, Stephen? Yeah, um, I think I, I want to really challenge, uh, kind of challenge specifically leaders of local churches. So either, you know, pastors, elders, uh, ministry leaders of, of local churches specifically, because I think 
sometimes some of, sometimes I've encountered sort of an attitude amongst local churches, especially if the church has not really been very missional in the past. And there can be kind of almost like maybe a fear or even a cynicism and think, oh yeah, that works because, you know, Julianne's on campus. That's, that's only for uni students. That wouldn't work here. Or, you know, Jamie's, you know, you know, he's, he's got like that old subculture that he knows so well. That's why it works for him, but it won't work here. And I just want to sort of just challenge that and, and to say that the, the spirit of God has gifted people within your church, even if you yourself aren't their evangelist, to do, to do the work of, of evangelism. And, and as a pastor, you know that Paul tells Timothy, do the work of evangelists. And to really reflect on um, what, what is our um, evangelistic or missional pathway? How, how are we going to win people for the loss? Hmm. And and I think if you don't have one, um, I, I, I really encourage you to, to use Julianne's pathway as a starting point, as a template to start thinking about it. Um, and if you even if you do have one, this is a great opportunity to review it. Just maybe maybe use the, te- the that that six step pathway to sort of you know compare with what you're currently already doing, um, and 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 see see what could be done better maybe. And and just um, and also just to tag a second thing in, just to, to don't forget to identify those evangelists and, and, um, and, and invest in them. Yep. Great. Jamie. Yeah, I, I would encourage Christians to realize that in doing evangelism, uh, evangelism is not just about the person that you're speaking to, but uh, God's using that experience to grow you. You know, and many times I've sat down with people and I'm listening and I'm sharing. And as I'm, you know, praying with them or for them or, you know, working through the issues, the Lord's doing a power of work on my heart in that moment. Mm. You know, and I, I would never think it's up to me to, to, to save that soul or bear the burden. Uh, Jesus bears all the burden. Uh, or I'm just there to love and serve that person, to listen, to know that quite often uh, God's using his experience to shape and, and, and mold me and uh, grow me through the moment. So I wouldn't want people to, they feel they're not good enough or they don't know, just, just listen listen well and know that in that moment, God's working on both hearts. It's not just not your responsibility to talk to them. It's, it's, it's realizing that you've come before God and, and God's working through that moment through both mm. of you. Mm. Don't, you shouldn't feel the weight of it. Yeah, people, some people are going to be gifted at this. I mean, if you put me at my um, daughter's ballet class and get <laughs> class and I'm going to, I'm going to be terrible. Right? I will. Um, it, like like football, I respect football. Like I respect that. I respect all. <laughs> but I don't know anything about them, you know. So um, if we're gifted in different ways, that's great. Um, but but still, when I'm um, I'm taking my daughter to those classes, I'm I'm still talking to people. I'm still interacting. Yeah. I know that God is building relationships there as I go. So I'd say to people, you know, allow God to work on your heart in those moments as well. Yeah, Jamie and belly shoes. That's a sight for sore eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we'll go. We'll take a couple of questions now. I'm surprised not no one's actually popped in a question into the Q and A function. But um, Andrew Coop has sent in a question via old fashioned email. Uh, Andrew Coop's from the ACT, so right across the country, um, and he asks, "One area of local mission probably is my extended family and friends. I wonder if there is something out there that you can say. As you know, I am a Christian." Here's something on my phone I'd like to talk to you about that takes them through the gospel, um, ask for a response, and there's the opportunity for follow-up. So I think what he's asking is, is there a mobile resource that presents the gospel to his family and friends? Um, and I suppose if there's not one, do you guys have any insights on um, how we can be missional with our extended family and friends? Because they, they are, you know, um, I'm sure many of us will relate there. It is quite a difficult mission for you. It sort of depends a bit on what their family's like or their friends are like. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so like the reason for God is a... Oh dear. ...resource that you can, yeah, share useful to believe in sorry julianne could i you, love the videos sorry julianne could you uh, repeat yourself the last five seconds you froze on on screen okay all right uh yeah so that i think there's actually a heap of resources i um have a whole page just of the gospel presented all the different video clips um yeah connections 
just so that I have a resource. So I try and actually gather all the time. Anything you see on the internet, you should be like gathering them and working out what would be suitable. And then at different times, work out what's useful for your family and friends. Um, yeah, just even some of the stuff on Alpha um, mm. as we've been going through, it's just really well presented. And yeah, I think they're useful resources as well, just as people have questions as you're talking with them or yeah, it's, it's you actually being really resourced as much as you can um, yep. to be able to, yeah, then pinpoint what would be helpful for your family or friends. Yeah. I think um, for me, I'll just speak to that just from my experience. So my, my wife uh, comes from a, a very secular atheistic uh, family. So she was the first convert in a family. Um, her father even says he likes to, to say this, uh, that he's a born again atheist. Um, and he kind of grew up really mocking um, Christians. And that's kind of the, the, the family she's come, come from. So she, she, she was converted, you know, on, on, at university by, by someone else before I met her. But, um, but uh, over the years, we led her, her sister to Christ. Hmm. And only just a few months ago, uh, we led her mom to Christ after, for me, like wow. evangelizing her for like close wow. to 10 years. And it was really, and talk about COVID. It was the COVID was part of the thing that really... Wow. Kind of wow. A confluence of factors that kind of, she was personal health crisis, but then plus COVID and all these things that really kind of forced her to think about her mortality. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, and I think, you know, as, as much as you want to talk about what's the best resource, and I don't really have a good answer for that because I actually think there's no silver bullet. You've just mm. got to have a range of resources and think yeah. what's good for this person, what's good for that person. Like I've given someone the reason for God book that I think Julianne mentioned before. And they were converted through reading Reason for God, but it's only ever happened once. So I'm not going to, I'm not telling my whole church, Hey, just give out this book. It's going to, it's going to convert everyone. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, there's no silver bullet, but, but with my, with my uh, mother-in-law, I, I say I'm evangelizing her for 10 years. It's not like for 10 years, I'm coming to her with, Hey, here's another different outline. Here's the, you know, four spiritual laws. And here's like, uh, you know, two ways to live and until she gets it. Right. It's actually first love. It's the same thing in the pathway loving her right serving her like serving her in, in ways that other people around her don't 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 even serve her like and some sometimes i kind of in you know, some moments we actually make make her own kids look bad because I have <laughs> but but um but to the point where then she's willing to ask questions and 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 i'm just answering her her, her questions dealing with what tim keller calls the feeder beliefs what what are the barriers to belief and then to the point where i'm allowed to talk about jesus and, and, and tell about how wonderful Jesus is. And just tell it like over and over again, just painting a picture of how amazing is Jesus? Hmm. Why is that? And the thing is, not just kind of teaching people propositional truth, like, you know, here, and, and there's a place for that, right? And that's the Bible step. But it's actually helping them see how wonderful Jesus is, the, the man, the person, the, the, the God man, the savior, hmm. the resurrected king, but also how he's changed your life. So sharing real testimonies. And hmm. the thing about family is, they know the best and the worst of you. So you can't pretend and be the holy Christian. Like they, they yeah. know, like so my mother-in-law, right? She knows all of my bad habits. Yeah. She's seen kind of me and in my, my sin. Yeah. And so I don't, I, don't, I don't apologize for that in the sense that I say, look, that's why, that's why I, I'm a Christian because I'm actually a horrible sinner. And yeah. without Jesus, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm wretched. I'm, I'm absolutely doomed. Yeah. So, so I would say, you know, actually, if you think about that pathway, that works on an individual level as well. And, and I'd say then when it comes to that point where you're like got that Bible step or the G, you know, that step towards the end of the process, that's when you bring out that tool, whatever it is. But you've still got the first four, five, four, four steps to work through before you get there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's all good. That's all good. And, I, and I would add to what, what uh, both Stephen and Julianne are saying is uh, your family who's the closest to you can sometimes be the hardest to, to follow your way. Like, especially for example, uh, denominations, you, you know, you might want them to come along to your style of church, or, but they might find their own path. I think if you're looking, especially with, with family, you've got to give them the, the freedom to find their own path. They might like a different worship style, a different church, and, you know, just because I'm Anglican doesn't mean, you know, uh, my, my mother-in-law might become Anglican. Might, <laughs> local Pentecostal church and, and be happy or, or whatever yeah. it is. 
we actually started early on in Grapplers for Christ Australia to make it non-denominational. It, it just didn't matter. And through that freedom, we found uh, a lot of our, our friends and members, uh, Catholic or Orthodox, uh, we, we didn't mind what, uh, what, what church background or what denomination. We just wanted to, as followers of Christ, as brothers and sisters come together. Um, and, and as long as we were following Jesus and could pray together. And actually through that, we've learned a lot from each other. One of, uh, one of the great leaders in GPC Australia is a man called Ninos and he's a Syrian Orthodox. And I've learned so much about not only his culture, but uh, the way he follows Jesus or, or visited his church. You know, I, I wouldn't have known all this if I hadn't gone outside my, my own mm. family. And mm. I think it's important to, um, to look to, especially family, give them the freedom to, mm. to define their own path and, and you know, be there and, and, and support and listen and trust mm. and care and pray. Everything starts in prayer. Yet, uh, give them the freedom and don't try and say, you've got to come here. Is this what works for me? You know, I think you've got to give them yeah. that freedom. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, we've got a couple of questions that popped in. So I might ask each panelist to uh, limit their answers to a minute. Sorry, just so that we can get to everyone's questions. Um, so um, second question from Martin Wilson. Uh, what do you think are a couple of great icebreaker questions post-COVID to ask our friends that could lead in well to a deeper gospel conversation? Thanks. Martin from Darabin Presbyterian Church, Melbourne. Bring him to Renegade. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Couple of rolls and. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Could well, I ask um, yep. what challenged you about yourself? Like, I think that's an interesting thing in that you spend so much time with yourself in COVID time. Like, what mm. challenged you about who you are and who you. Yeah. You could ask them what you worked out, what was really important um, and see where that leads. Like, yeah, there's a heap of different ways you could go in terms of trying to lead mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, that, that's, yeah, those are really good. I think, um, um, I think the first step often is not, uh, may not be going straight to a, a, a spiritual conversation, but actually moving out of the realm of small talk to a DMM, DNM, like deep and meaningful, meaningful conversation. So maybe like, um, yeah, what, what, what did you learn from your, your time in COVID? What did you, what did you struggle with? And I actually think that, yeah. um, at, um, that when, if you've thought of a question, so let's say what, 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 what did you struggle with in, in during this COVID time, be ready to share your own thing. So I actually think the really, really important thing is actually being vulnerable. Mm. That when you share something that's actually broken in, in your own life, that that gives them um, the permission and even encourages them to be honest as well and from there you can actually identify maybe an issue that they're facing or potentially even an idol and then you're able to tailor the gospel to that particular thing that they're facing so so instead of a question i'm going to just kind of encourage vulnerability that's good good um we'll take one more question and just so just before i forget um Jamie gave the answer, come to Renegade. If you do want to actually join his gym, um, I'm sure he'll be more than happy to have you come along to his gym. His gym is at Kensington, so the inner west of Melbourne. Um, and Jimmy, where can people find more information about your gym? Uh, website, renegademma.com.au. However, yep. not till after June 22. Oh, right? true. Coming to Lynn, so we're just, we're hibernating to Lynn. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I think one of your guys in the um in the crowd just said come to renegade so <laughs> there you go uh, so, yeah sure so from another anonymous attendee uh, and this one is probably for julianne some christians are and even pastors would say many of the items in the framework earn strictly evangelism sharing the gospel word how do you start the conversation if you want to think holistically about mission at church Yeah, like you don't have to put that under evangelism. That pathways to leading to people becoming more open, and I think that's what you want is you actually want people to feel more and more and more comfortable, so that their heart is 
more and more open to yeah finding out who Jesus is and I think sometimes we put a lot of effort in the bottom ones and not much effort in the top ones but actually in some ways we've got to have more effort in the top ones because that's yeah if you have a lot of people that you're loving but then only a few of those end up you're getting to know then a few of those end up having questions then even less of those end up wanting to know about Jesus. We're sort of going to have a lot of contacts, if that makes sense, and in thinking hard about who we actually can love and minister to. So, yeah, I think people want people to know Jesus, um, but actually we've got to put in the hard work mm. of all the other categories. Yep. Can I quickly say something, Wayne? Just yep. from a, because Julian has given a really good practical uh, answer to that. I'm going to give a theological one, which is, if I was talking to that guy, I would say to him first, I agree with you that evangelism is strictly proclamation. That's how I understand the word. Um, and But the, the, how you then tackle that is first agree with that. That's what evangelism is. But then say, there's actually two categories at play here. That's evangelism, which is strictly proclamation. But then I would say the other category is actually mission. And and that's broader. So, so if you can think of two concentric circles, think of maybe mission, is this bigger one and then evangelism is kind of in the center and that's more specific but there's other things that you do other than gospel proclamation to to lead someone to christ for example prayer prayer is part of missional activity but it's not evangelism mm. right but you do it it's, a, it, it's helpful for the mission right yeah. so so uh, then you, we love people let's say love your neighbor as yourself love love one another those are those are, uh, are, are commands of, of scripture those are, are are not evangelism technically but they're helpful to the mission. And I'll just define the mission by the great commission of making disciples of all nations, um, uh, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey. So, so just help, helpful to have those two categories and think what's evangelism proper and what's missional activity. And that includes prayer, blessing your neighbors, sharing your testimony, all of those things that will give you an opportunity, will increase your likelihood, give you an opportunity, like almost like win the right or win the, their, 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 their trust so that you can proclaim Christ. Yeah. And you want people to last the long term as well. So it's, you actually want to have them fairly integrated and you want to make disciples over the long term. Um, so even if someone does become a Christian, like we used to say really at uni, like it would be a year before we would definitely say, yeah, they've got it. Because it takes a long time to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Sure, yeah. Um, on that note, uh, we've, we've just had an interesting question come in. So from an anonymous attendee um, asking, doesn't Jesus call us to make disciples, not just converts? Otherwise, mission is dualistic. Um, so I, I'm guessing that the question has to do with it's not just trying to convert people into Christians, but how do, what's the long-term discipleship is, you know, um, I'm sure you guys understand the question. Any no, thoughts on that? I think that it's, it's critical to be prepared to walk with people. It's not a matter of, oh, I've shared the gospel with him, let's tick the box and move to the next one yeah. and rack up scalps for the kingdom. That's not the way it works. The way it works is to be embedded in people's lives. Yeah. Uh, when people renegade, it's there for the, the long term. Now, granted that all relationships end, even my wife who I love, Jesus will call her home one day and that relationship will end. So they may come into Renegade and, and be in that path for a while, yeah. but it will end. You know, but in that time, it's it's me to walk with them. It's me to care for them as Christians where we walk with the people who are at our church or in our lives. And a, a big part of that is getting to a church, getting alongside a church uh, or taking people with you to the church. Many people I have taken along to uh, in Inner West Church in Inner West. Uh, Pete Greenwood runs a church just around the corner from mm. the gym. He's so invested. He's trained with me. He's there three times a week. Um, or uh, sitting on a hill, people in the city, we meet in there. We go to church. We're walking with people. It's not just share the gospel, have a cup of coffee, see you later. Yep. It's, it's planning to be a part of their life. And I would say to uh, Christians, we're called to be hearers of the word and doers of the word. Where they have to walk together in faith and action. Uh, yeah. we, we can't just 
you know, study theology and stay at home and read our books. I mean, that, that's fantastic. Yet we want to add to that doing with the, the word, take that word out and share with people and be prepared to live lives with people. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Amen. Um, yeah. I'll just say quickly as well. The, the, the whole reason I became a church planter is because I, I, God convicted me that I wasn't just meant to be making converts. I was meant to be making disciples. And I think before, when I was younger, I had a very like, you know, like that dualistic thing that you said, I, I had a very short term view. I was like, Oh, I just need to get them over the line. So they don't burn, burn in hell for eternity. But, um, but, but I realized then that for them to actually, the great commission actually has both those things, right? Um, baptize them, which is leading them to conversion, but then teaching them to obey all that Christ has commanded. And that's a lifelong process. And I think the way that happens is in a local church, a body of believers that will help walk with them and disciple them until the day they see Jesus face to face. So that's part of the mission. So that's why if you think of the Great Commission, there's both that kind of evangelistic thing where you're bringing them to the point of conversion, but then also decide, lifelong discipleship, teaching them to obey all that Christ has commanded. Amen. Cool. Um, I think we'll, we'll leave it at there. Thank you so much um, to you guys for bringing your insights, your wisdom, your experience um, into this topic of mission evangelism and being innovative in this season. Uh, I think we, we um, I, I certainly learned a lot from you guys, just speaking to you guys over the phone and over the last one hour. Um, again, if you guys would like to get a copy of Julianne's material, um, do message me and I'll, I'm, oh, great. I'll put you on the list down, Jamie. Uh, it will take some time um, because it's such a big package. I'll have to repackage it for everyone. Um, but I'll, I'll definitely send you guys the link once it's ready. Um, if you also want to check out Renegade Gym, you want to be a part of um, Jamie's gym, you want to have get your fitness up to scratch or you want Jamie to be your chaplain uh, to take you to the next level, shouting down and breathing down your neck. Um, do Google Renegade Gym in Kensington um, online and you'll find the details there. Um, Regeneration Church Monash, you can also uh, Google the details um, online or on Facebook. So once again, thank you everyone for being part of this webinar. Thank you for attending. Um, I hope you've taken something really good away and you will be able to apply it into your ministries, into your contacts, into your work vocation and stay safe. Um, and until we meet you in the flesh and again, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.